happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome back to this month's topic, uh, finding external assets, active and passive information gathering. Uh, so first thing I want to do, if you haven't been here before, just want to welcome you to our tech talk and give you a little bit of background on myself and uh, our guest speaker, Chris Pruitt, here today. So my name is Noah King. I'm a senior software engineer with Horizon 3. I've had most of my focus in the last five years in software development, and I've recently shown a big interest into getting into the cybersecurity space. So I am quite the newbie compared to Chris, and this is our tech talk series where we just bring in experts. We talk about a topic in depth. We walk through the methodology, the tools, what um, you know, hackers, what ethical hackers are all doing um, in this space. So. Uh, welcome, everyone. Chris, it's great to see you again. Um, Good to see you, too. Us with the first Tech Talk. So, Chris, you want to give a quick intro to the audience and we can get started? Yeah, good uh, Good to be here again. Always always good to talk to you, Noah. Um, Chris Pruitt, CTO of Inversion 6. We're an IT security company. Um, early, uh, early partner, early adopter with Horizon 3. have been a uh, proud partner with you guys for a while. And... Um, we have uh, rebranded. Uh, we used to be uh, called MRK Technologies. We even have our own beer. Um, funny enough, our one of our sister companies is a uh, brewery in uh, outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and we've got a, uh, a special IPA. So uh, next time you or any of the uh, Horizon Three folks are in town, would love to uh, take you to the brewery uh, and uh, get some of this. So um, glad to be here. and Looking forward to talking to you again. Awesome. Yeah. Welcome back. And we love. We love beer H Street, so we will definitely have to take you up on that offer. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead. Let's kind of get started with today. So for the audience, um, if you do have any questions along the way, feel free to, of course, put those into chat. We will monitor those. We can also answer your questions. We'll also be doing a raffle at the end where we'll just give away a gift card uh, to a member of the audience. Um, but before we do that, let's just let's dive into the topic of finding external assets, how you do passive information gathering and active. So um, I guess, Chris, what I'll do is I'll always kind of give you what I've learned in the yeah. last month and a half um, with no prior really experience um, on the topic. So let's imagine that we have a fictitious company here called uh, DunderMifflin.com. And I really want to target Dunder Mifflin. I really want to get on their networks, uh, get their data, and, and just kind of get to the point of domain admin. In there but i can't start there i can't start on your network i have to start from the outside uh, so we're starting from the external for me the big takeaway is there are two different approaches to finding external assets and to ta attacking this target there's a passive approach and there is an active approach the passive approach is using more third-party tools google linkedin github seeing what's out there just available on the internet that I might be able to use against you or to build word lists, users, emails. There's so many technologies. There's so many things that you can go down. It's not always about the tools. It's about the methodology and the mindset. Mm -hmm. So that's the first piece. And then there's also the active information gathering as well. Once I've identified that Dunder Mifflin runs on these IPs and is running, you know, JavaScript, jQuery on the front end, they're running a SQL database with Apache, and I have more info about your tech stack, your employees, their code bases, all of that, I'm going to start engaging with you actively, scanning for ports that are open, um, looking for things that just might be of uh, value to me, to allow me onto that network. Chris, is that kind of how you would phrase it, or can you add some clarity to that too? No, I, th I think you did a, a, a really good job. Um, I'll tell you what, could you share the, uh, the MITRE framework? I, I want to uh, kind of show and talk through a little bit. Um, so for, the, for those uh, unfamiliar, MITRE has created a, uh, a framework called ATT&CK, and this is really how attackers operate in, uh, in, in the space. Um, they've got a... Um, so it, it starts at the left-hand side, and what we're really talking about today is reconnaissance, um, both kind of active and passive. Uh, you, you'll see, you know, if an, if, if an attacker is trying to target a particular company, uh, the order of operation is from left to right. They're, they're um, trying to gather as much information as they can. 
then developing resources, kind of their own toolkit, and, and from there execution begins, you know, trying to get into the networks. Oftentimes companies are, are built the built the same way. You know, what, what you're talking about is um, you know, from that uh, kind of pen tester or red team perspective, operating like an attacker, right? We are trying to mimic how attackers operate. What information is freely available in the market that I can utilize that might get me to be able to open a door a little bit to get inside someone's company? Um, LinkedIn, great resource, right? Uh, from there, I can find all of the people that work at a particular organization or maybe 80 or 90% of them. With the username or with the uh, uh, first name and last name, their, their usernames are likely first initial, last name, right? So now I have half of the key potentially to get in, right? They may have a, a, a portal, they may have uh, um, some platform, some exposed application uh, without multi-factor authentication that maybe I can get into. Um, and what attackers and pen testers often do is, is we're gonna look for low hanging fruit from a password perspective. Right, and, and this is more active targeting using summer 2022 exclamation, but a lot of that intelligence gathering is going to directly feed uh, what tools and attack paths am I going to um, uh, pursue in, uh, in this operation. You may look at job postings on LinkedIn or, or some other website, right? Where, oh, I see that they're running SAP as their ERP system. Um, I see that they uh, have um, uh, applications that are hosted in AWS um, and they're looking for AWS developers or um, uh, AWS architects, right? So passively, I can get a good bit of information, even MX records. Is their email hosted in uh, Gmail G Suite or are they O365 or potentially are they on-prem? Uh, the MX records also might expose whether they're using a Mimecast or Proofpoint if, if phishing is kind of within, uh, within my operation. So a lot of good detail and um, uh, planning can come out of your, your recon uh, that you're, you're trying to perform. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And one of the things that I've been learning a lot, especially as you're a newer attacker, Recon is very important. The more information I can gather, the more I have saved, the more I can use later down the line as I'm going after this target. And so I've started to realize, you know, you really have to look at everything that's out there on the web. Um, there's a lot of ways in which hackers think creatively. So you need to also think creatively um, when, when you're doing these approaches. And like you said, you know, uh, I have a fictitious company that we'll use. We'll use Megacork One. Mm -hmm. They have a LinkedIn. They have a website. They have GitHub. What all are they sharing out there on the web openly? And where are there maybe just some human errors or I'm sharing too much information that I can leverage for myself? I find the passive piece very, um, you know, exciting. And there's there's a lot there. And so, yeah, we're really going to cover and go into more detail of this reconnaissance phase. So I think the first thing that I'll do um, is let's talk about in general, let's imagine we got a target, right? Our target is gonna be megacorp1.com. What I might start with um, is, is looking up their website, seeing what all are they putting out there? It looks like they have a website here. Um, it's just a generic corporate website, welcome to you know, our company, uh, they do nanotechnology, this and that. I might start looking around. I might start looking into the source code, uh, mm -hmm. looking into what technologies. I can see they're using Apache. I can see they have jQuery here. There's a lot of information here that already I'm, I'm collecting and I'm knowing. If I'm really good uh, with jQuery, I've done some jQuery in the past, maybe I go down that route. Or maybe if I know that this Apache version is vulnerable, that might be something as well. So there's a lot that you can do, but I think the first thing is really just kind of going in, looking at the corporate website, poking around. One of my favorite ones that I see a lot these days is like the about, meet our team. You got Joe Shear, CEO. His email is joe at megacorp1.com. I, I feel like when you see a lot of these corporate emails and, and some of this info, 
I, I feel like I have your, your username or part of your login. Now I just need the password. Is that what your thoughts are, Chris? Yeah, I mean, that, that's really it. It's a good place to start, right? If, uh, if I have half of the key and I have a lot of the employees, uh, first names, last names, um, you know, I, I can uh, att attempt a, a kind of quiet brute force effort where I'm using, you know, kind of a, a simple password. Maybe it's Megacorp one, the number one exclamation, you know, something that, you know, new employees might get, something that uh, people who've been around the, the company might have started with and maybe didn't change their password. Um, you know, cer certainly don't want to lock accounts, but, you know, again, trying to gather as much information as we can. From an attacker perspective, you know, a CEO, a CFO may not have the access required. These are kind of figureheads within a company. Um, and may not have access to an ERP or accounting or, or wide scale access to the company. Um, but you can often find mid level managers and others that could be good targets. Um, you know, if, if I'm an attacker or, or a red teamer and I'm trying to get into an organization, you know, who, who works there that's in HR that I could send a, uh, a resume to? And within that resume, I've got some uh, uh, malicious VB script or PowerShell code. Um, uh, that, that can create a reverse shell. A lot of different ways to get in, but the more, and you, you, you were spot on, the more information I have, the better off I am, right? I, I can't go in blind. I need, um, uh, even when pen testers are performing kind of black box tests, they're still doing a bit of OSINT research on the internet. Uh, the more information that you have that you can start with, the better off you're going to be creates efficiencies, will speed things along, and, and instead of kind of stumbling around in a dark room, um, you know, banging your head into the wall, you know, having an idea of where maybe the door handle could be within that room is uh, uh, very helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the, the biggest thing is the more info you get, the more users you collect, knowing your audience, knowing who your target is, if I know that this person, Tanya, is a senior developer and I want to maybe get onto developer systems or into the databases, she might have access to it compared to, you know, like a marketing director. So knowing your audience, uh, looking into social medias, Twitter, uh, I think on this website somewhere too, they even have links to their GitHub. Let's see if this link works. It does. That allows me to now go into looking at their GitHub, where all their code base is stored. What are they publicly sharing? Maybe they're doing open source. They're just sharing some kind of packages that they've built that mm -hmm. they use. And then they're like, hey, we will offer this up. I see that a lot as well. And, um, you know, if I want to be curious and I just want to kind of gather more intel, I'm not actively engaging with the target right now. This is the passive piece. I'm engaging with GitHub. They have this info. Nobody's going to be the wiser that I'm looking at this. Uh, so it's a very quiet way too to gather more intel compared to to active, wouldn't you say, Chris? Yeah, um, you know, GitHub re repositories uh, can be uh, incredibly helpful. Um, you know, may show uh, things that they're doing. Um, they could potentially leave usernames and passwords in in configuration files. Uh, there could be uh, private keys for certificates that are are there as well. Um, there are the the occasional breach where people have left things exposed in uh, in GitHub, um, you know. But it, for for a from a resource perspective, it it is valuable to again try and hit all of these um, uh, kind of different repositories, different uh, places where organizations may have data that that could again, allow you to crack that door open a little bit or give you some insight on what uh, what might be uh, uh, residing behind that door. Exactly. And I think this is a good example here. If you go look at their GitHub, I started poking through their, their commit messages manually. There are tools that, of course, can automate this and can save me time, but um, we're doing it manually. And we can see that they, they pushed up a lot of files, folders, and if I keep looking, you can see the old site. Mm -hmm. They accidentally included the old site. There is a Robox TXT. And the one that's more interesting is the Megacorp XAMPP users. You can see there's a username. Here's a password. I might be able to go somewhere with that. And 
from what I've gathered, a lot of times people will accidentally push an API key. They will accidentally push a password. It might be when you're starting off that repo and mm. you remove it and you push it and you think you're good, but it's in that commit history. I can still get it out. Yeah, um, you know, for, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, a lot of organizations will still hard code things, right? They, they might not be using uh, a secrets manager or, or um, uh, they may have uh, test API keys that all fully allow access to um, maybe a test or, or a QA database, which is a mirror of production. Um, you know, oftentimes developers may, um, and, and it's a matter of convenience, may make mistakes and leave some of these things out there uh, that can be taken advantage of. Yeah, exactly. It's just thinking about like, what mistakes have you made? I, I made this mistake as a developer in the past where I've pushed something and hard coded password or whatever. You know, I've had a lot of students that have done that too. And, um, you know, it happens. So something to be aware of. This is one approach that I can take. Some other approaches, of course, there's many tools. The tools aren't really always, again, the priority here. It's the methodology. What can I get out of them? Mm -hmm. A lot of them do the same things. There's one that I like that I was kind of messing around with called DNS Dumpster. Mm -hmm. And I can just come in here and I say megacorp1.com. Let's search that target. I can already start seeing where are their DNS servers? What are their name servers? Maybe I go into a zone transfer, which becomes a more active um, approach, but I can see the mail records for MX that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. I can see, let me zoom this in, it's a little small. Uh, so I can see all these IPs, I can see where they're located. I can kind of go through here, see some host records. And you know, we're just looking what looks imp uh, important or sticks out, admin.megacorp1.com. Right. That admin URL or that subdomain, that might be important to me. So anything I can grab in a really passive way is just, you know, more fuel for me to, uh, to use later. Uh, do you find yourself in general using a lot of these tools or is there some that you, you really like to use daily? One, uh, one tool, and I've, I've been a, uh, a fan of it for a long time, uh, Recon NG, um, was written... Um, and initially put together by Tim Tomes, um, brilliant guy. Early on, that tool was very interesting because it was doing screen scraping and a lot of things um, uh, to be able to pull information. And there used to be a website called data.com where you it, it was essentially kind of a, a back-end or public repository for like Salesforce data, salesforce.com eventually bought them, hid them, but you can find out uh, via, via query just who who works where, what's their email, what's their phone number. I want everybody that works for microsoft.com, fbi.gov, and data.com used to, uh, to expose that. A lot of the um, kind of modules that uh, ReconNG uh, will utilize are now all um, uh, API based. So they, they, you may need a, a LinkedIn API, uh, Shodan, another, uh, another great tool um, for uh, uh, kind of um, uh, internet scanning, you know, it's um, banner grabbing, that kind of thing. Uh, that can be queried through Recon NG with an API key, Hacker Target, Harvester, Pwned List, Virus Total. They've got a, a lot of different modules in here and makes uh, kind of that reconnaissance or, or um, you, you know, in, in a sense, enumeration, uh, very easy, very efficient, um, having, uh, um, you know, access to all of those Bing, uh, Google Maps, uh, Google, a, a lot of different ways to pull information. And, and this makes it very, very efficient. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. I have Recon NG pulled up here. If you have Kali, uh, it's usually pre-built and installed or you might have to add it, but it is a really cool tool. I've used it a little bit. It reminds me a lot of a Metasploit style of, let me load this module, let me point Megacorp at it, run it, exploit it. And um, it, it just really automates a lot of things. There's a lot of awesome plugins. So that's an awesome tool that I've been using as well. So definitely check that one out. But you also brought up some other ones as well. You brought up Shodan, you brought up um, a lot. Let's, let's pull up Shodan as well. 
Uh, so this one's pretty cool. And you kind of said it, Shodan goes out there, they scan the whole internet. What is connected to the internet and what can we find out there? One thing that I'm gonna search, I'm gonna search for a host name of megacorp1.com. They have a lot of different search filters you can add um, and you can always look at their documentation. I'm looking for that company, their website. I'm gonna run a scan, see what uh, Shodan has and can provide. And again, I'm still not interacting with Megacorp. I'm not right. interacting with that company. There is no alerting of my, my activity. This is a really behind the scenes, quiet way to, to gather a lot of info. Would you say that this is probably one of the most pivotal parts uh, to do well? Because the more info, the more you collect, the more prepared you are for the active engagement with it. Yeah, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of pen testing um, is really sample testing and you, you could easily bypass or, or miss some opportunities, some low hanging fruit. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, scroll, uh, scroll all the way up. One thing that you'll see on the left-hand side there, top ports, right? Um, already, we've got uh, four exposed hosts for Megacorp uh, that have uh, SSH open, right? You've got, you've got a, uh, a key that you exposed, um, a username and password uh, uh, from GitHub, uh, maybe potentially you have access to a, a particular host. Um, you know, very, it, it, it's likely portalized access, right? Um, but here you also see the uh, the portals. There are a, a couple different websites that are running. Maybe one of those is Chris, the- uh, I lost your audio. Can you hear me? No. I can hear you, Chris. Okay. Noah, can you hear me? We'll, we'll pause for a second. Let's see if you can figure that out. I think I might have heard something. Go ahead and talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're back. Good. Okay. Um, you know, we, with that, this is probably the, uh, the credentials that you got are likely portalized credentials, um, you know, from the, uh, uh, um, uh, that you got from GitHub. Could be, could be in this list. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But again, you may find some interesting nuggets of information here that could allow you uh, to walk into the front door of a company. Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing to think about too. Like there's always that saying of hackers don't uh, break in, they log in. And yeah. so I, I start looking for your keys, your usernames. Um, I go to your LinkedIn, who works at Megacorp? Here's a list of all the employees and let me build a, a user list out of those employees' names. Um, if your name is Noah King, maybe it's Noah at whatever email or Noah King at this. And so there's a lot of different approaches that we can take. It, it really just comes back to being creative, using all these tools. Shodan is great. Um, looking at the websites, other tools, there's a ton out there. GitHub, Shodan, all of that. One more that I have that I think is pretty cool, um, Recon NG is great too is the harvester we talked about this one a little bit i can run another cali tool that's built in the harvester what is your domain megacorp1.com give me the list results 500 go after google see what you can find on google what can you harvest out of google searches i don't want to do all this manual work i'm lazy i'm going to try to automate it and so what it's going to go out through is just harvest credentials usernames uh, sometimes a little finicky that they'll block your IP and everything if they feel like you're a bot. Uh, so we'll see if we can get it to return. Sometimes you got to turn a VPN on, but there's so much that you can do. The, the tools isn't the thing. Just remember the methodology of it's just be creative. If I see a company on that's very active on Stack Overflow asking questions about, hey, we're trying to do AWS Cognito authentication. How does this work? What are the things? That might give me some some additional detail. And it looks yeah. like it didn't pull back, but it, it normally does. There's a, um, you know, I, I know you're going through uh, OSCP and you're learning a good bit of information on um, uh, kind of passive and active discovery, you know, from a, from a system perspective. There's a, uh, an organization called uh, Bellingcat um, that uh, does more in the OSINT space um, but a lot of the methods, a lot of the methodology that they, uh, that they, uh, teach, um, 
uh, very, very beneficial. You know, earlier you brought up a website, we had some names, we had some uh, Twitter handles. Um, uh, Bellingcat has uh, classes that you can take. I've, I've taken a couple over the years. Um, very beneficial and there are websites that you can go to provide a username maybe from one of the people that we saw the ceo of the company and we can we can see on the 50 other social media platforms is that same account being used um, or is there a reference from that account to a, a like account on some other site um, you know, maybe we see their, their Instagram feed, maybe, you know, we, we get some other detailed information. The, um, you, you probably uh, recall just uh, in the past couple of weeks, Cisco, um, the, the large network company got breached um, and they had a, uh, an engineer that was essentially attacked through kind of personal connections. Their browser was uh, attacked and, um, essentially and dumped all usernames and passwords. The attacker was able to log into VPN access uh, through kind of a multi-factor authentication brute force. Um, you know, I, I, attackers are going to utilize any means possible, right? They, they, if they can get personal information and that gets them further up the stack in trying to target the organization, they'll certainly utilize it. Um, some really, you know, at some point, maybe post OSCP, I would highly recommend if, if you're interested in um, uh, intelligence gathering and how better to do uh, passive discovery, um, you know, how to identify where, a, where in the world a picture may have come from. Um, you know, they, they've got some incredible classes and uh, um, very, uh, uh, very helpful skill set to have. Uh, in, in the direction that you're moving. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the important piece too for anybody else that is also learning security or is a practitioner is there's so much to learn. There's so much to do. At least dive your feet into every area. See what is interesting to you and what you have a natural knack for and just continue to you know, learn more as you go. You brought up, uh, you know, like the OSINT, the Bellingcat, the, the social media. One that I also saw and was going through is called the Social Searcher. Um, I don't know if you've seen this one, but basically what I can do is I can go look for anything. Like, let me search for Megacorp One. What is being mentioned about Megacorp One and social media? And it might look through Twitter. It might look through LinkedIn, any of the other social platforms. This might be a good way for me to build out different word lists. Uh, hey, we're releasing a new product and it's called, you know, whatever, um, Megacorp2, maybe that's a password that everybody uses. And so uh, you can see LinkedIn posts, maybe that leads me going down the LinkedIn trail and seeing what's there, nothing's really there. Um, there's a GitHub post, there's so much, so you can kind of start looking through and seeing what is happening as well on social media. And, and maybe you go after the user as well, uh, like you said. So. Yeah. 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 It's, um, you know, there, there are plenty of tools out there. A lot of bright people have developed things to make a lot of this very efficient, right? You don't need to go to Facebook and search LinkedIn and search. Um, there are a, a lot of these, uh, uh, toolkits out there that are, are grabbing information, um, uh, giving you the opportunity to, you know, query, analyze, um, and again, you might be able to pull that needle out of the haystack and this is how I'm going to get in. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, they, this is what attackers do. You know, they, they're just looking for that opportunity, kind of biding time, sitting and waiting until the, uh, uh, door is not locked. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Like it's also a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always think about, at least for me, is I have some cats. And my cats are very patient when they're trying to hunt a bird, um, a bug, or anything. They will sit there and watch it for hours until it's the right time for them to strike. It's the same thing for an attacker. You know, they might not have the information today. New information is always going up onto the internet. Maybe there will be a password exposed tomorrow, or maybe there will be a new employee that onboards, and that might be. Uh, an easy way and maybe they have a more temporary credential or easily guessable credential. So there's really a lot of ways we can go. Um, the main thing I feel like is be creative, think outside the box, 
there's a lot of tools. If you're doing it manually, you can probably find a tool that automates it. Uh, I think we'll pause here on the passive side and let's move over to the active side. Before mm -hmm. we do that, that will pop up a little bit of a poll on your page. We got a couple of questions just trying to help us uh, understand our audience a little bit better, what you're interested in, what brings you here to kind of uh, this tech talk. So if you could take a question, take a second to answer those questions while we switch over. Active discovery is certainly, uh, you know, more interesting, but, um, you know, these, um, you know, kind of what you're doing, right? Like we, we want to passively operate and then we want to actively operate. So we've, we've got some information now. What can we do with it? You know, banner grabbing, um, uh, you, you know, we, we want to see, you know, where things are at, what are they doing, start to interact with uh, some of the systems that we've been able to identify. Um, you know, visit websites, visit portals, um, start to poke on some of the services in, in ports that maybe we have uh, discovered along the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So going into the active discovery side, there's a lot of things that you can do as well. There's a lot of different approaches. There's DNS um, discovery. There is subdomain brute forcing, scanning ranges, port scanning, uh, S3 buckets, what's out there, what's open. Um, it really depends on your target and, and the technology and where you see that pathway going. But let's talk a little bit about that. I got a couple of different tools and commands that have helped me at least kind of understand that. The first thing that I might run is like, who is megacorp1.com? Simple command, who, who owns this domain? Who is it? What can you give me? And we can kind of see that it'll spit out some name servers. Mm -hmm. It will spit out some info about who registered the domain. It looks like Alan Grofield. Maybe I go look up Alan. Maybe he's the admin that manages a lot of the servers. Um, admin email, that might not get us anywhere. But I'm really just starting to look through, see what looks interesting. Um, some of these are a really good way to start proceeding. Now, one thing that's of interest, at least here for me, and that I, I always try, is I try to do a zone transfer. If you're not familiar with a zone transfer, um, I'll describe it and I'll let you as well, Chris. A zone transfer is really, I have a domain, megacorp1.com, and then all these DNS servers, they, they host all of this lookup. So if I say, give me megacorp1, it translates to an IP address. It's like a phone book. And these phone books, megacorp1, they might have admin, megacorp1, um, support, Megacorp one different subdomains that are part of that main top level domain. And so my goal is to try to interact with DNS and say, hey, can you transfer all the domains to me because I'm also a DNS server? Uh, it seems like I'm almost kind of pretending to be a DNS server. Um, is that how you would equate it, Chris? Yeah, you know, it's, um... It's kind of it, typically DNS, someone is kind of sitting on the other side of the desk and they've got the, uh, the phone book, right? And you're, you're asking, well, where does email go? Or where is their website? And you get, a, you get an answer back. Um, you know, in the case of zone transfer, you're asking, hey, can you just give me the phone book so I can look it up myself? So all of the records. Um, because prior to that, you may say, give me abc.megacorp1.com, and they say, well, there is no abc.megacorp1.com. Um, so it's this guessing game of what might be in there. Um, and over the years, a lot of organizations have uh, added a lot of subdomains. They may have them for marketing. Uh, they may have them for test environments. They may have them for subsidiary companies. They may have them for new product launches. They may have them for events. Um, and with that, they may have stale systems, stale records, stale hosts um, that uh, are, are sitting out that are on, on the internet that are uh, able to be attacked. But if you don't know what they are, if you, if you don't know how to go find them, you may, uh, you may pass over them. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing that I see a lot. That's at least always of interest to me. If you think about, I'm going to go buy a tool, Jenkins, or I'm going to go buy GitLab. For my team or my company a lot of times you can get custom domains it might be uh, megacorp1.gitlab.com or whatever um, so there's always these different panels we can try to go after and, and see really what all 
uh, is tied to this domain. So I'm gonna run a tool or a command here called DNS Recon. It's another built-in Kali tool, really automates it, makes it easier for you. You can do different commands to run a zone transfer with like dig and stuff like that. But let's run this DNS Recon. The domain is Megacorp1 and the type of recon we're doing is a uh, zone transfer. And you can see it's already pulling back some data here. And if we scroll up a little bit, we uh, got some SOA records. We got the name server one. It's going through all of our three name servers. It's trying the first one to zone transfer. It failed on the first one. It failed on the second one as well. So it's important to also try every name server. Not every one might work. One might be misconfigured, but it looks like the third one, it popped off and it worked. And now we can see we got some text records such as try harder, uh, Google site verification. Maybe it's like a Gmail login. Uh, we can see the mail records. But what's really interesting, and I think the best part is this. We have an admin, Megacorp1, beta, FS1, intranet, the seam, support, test. Um, a lot of times when I see like test, I feel like those are also low hanging fruit because somebody's mm -hmm. testing something, they spun it up, it's not gonna be hardened. That server is not gonna have a ton of security most likely except for defaults. Um, maybe that's a good target. Is there anything that kind of sticks out to you, Chris, once you do a zone transfer? What do you look for and where do you go next? Yeah, I mean, you know, many of these are uh, are interesting, right? Anything that may have a portal admin, um, you know, beta, uh, that, that could be, you know, very similar to test, right? They've got some new uh, product or, or thing that they're building. Uh, maybe you catch it early and like you said, maybe they haven't, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of gone through the process of securing things. Very common, um, you know, I've, I've been on uh, um, the uh, kind of consumer or, or corporate side of the desk for a lot of my career and things, you know, speed to market's important and we need to get there and we'll figure out how to secure it later. Um, you'd be surprised. VPN also interesting, right? You know, if you've done your homework, you've done some recon, you've gathered some credentials, well, maybe I can walk right through the front door. Um, you know, and, and that that's what often can and does happen with a lot of companies that get breached. Um, you know, I, I either buy some credentials in the underground, I fish credentials, or um, uh, am able to guess or brute force credentials and, and walk in. Um, you know, but these are um, uh, SNMP could be a great repository, same with support, same with uh, syslog. Um, you know, the, those I would suspect are going to be either hardened um, or difficult to get in, but could be a, a wealth of information if you get access to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you really think about it, this is just another, we're expanding the attack surface. Mm -hmm. The more I gather, the more my surface grows, the more I can try. And it hasn't taken me long. I know that we're walking through this in a happy path, but you might find all this in an hour. Yeah. And you can go from external to attempting to log into an SSH server within an hour or two. So really knowing what you're putting out there on the internet and what's available is important. Let's imagine though, that you can't do a zone transfer because a lot of times people are smart. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they do their, their good job of um, preventing these zone transfers and these misconfigurations. If I can't do that, maybe I need to brute force subdomains. And so again, we're gonna run our DNS recon command. DNS recon, we're still going after megacorp1.com, but instead of a zone transfer, I'm gonna give you a word list. I have a se security list that's on GitHub. It's called SecLIS. It's a discovery DNS, the top 5,000 subdomains. And it's just a word list. It will say like admin, email. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ones that are default. The type that we're going to try to do is BRT or brute force. We're going to brute force subdomains. I also threw a TAC V on it for verbose or B verbo uh, verbosity. You can start to see that it's starting to kick off a lot of requests to DNS. Hey, does yankee.megacorp1.com exist? Is there a zebra? Is there mail? There's a lot of different things. So we'll give this a second to kind of kick through. Um, but while we're waiting, how often do you see a lot of success as well with subdomain brute force? It seems like a pretty good approach. Yeah, I, I think you're going to have a lot more success with this in, in the real world. It's uh, zone transfers. Um, I've seen more uh, 
th th that be more successful internally with Active Directory systems that were misconfigured, um, you know, and in, internally it's uh, less of a risk. Um, externally, a lot of DNS is hosted by third-party providers. It's going to be UI access. You, you're not actually configuring things for transfer. Um, so I, I think a lot of that is going to be um, uh, rare that uh, that you're able to run by it. But brute forcing, uh, th this is something that uh, most companies won't even notice, this kind of activity that's going on. Um, the uh, DNS providers aren't necessarily protecting against or looking at this kind of data. They're just trying to answer requests as fast as possible. I was curious about that. That was one of my concerns. If you're trying to be stealthy right. and not raise alerts to intrusion detection systems or anything like that, would sending 5,000 requests to DNS, you know, alert them, hey, 5,000 came from this IP, just shut it down. But it sounds like there's really not a lot of security happening on the DNS side. Right, correct. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as you can see, we gotten some results back. They're somewhat similar, of course, to the zone transfer. You might have some more or some less, uh, or if anything, less. But it looks like we pulled most of them back. Admin, beta, intranet. We might not have seen that one. It might have been there. Uh, but I can start going after these as well. And it's really just wordless guessing. Does this domain work? No. Um, very simple in the approach. So now, once we've gotten to this point, we've done some zone transfer, we've brute force subdomains. I might also start looking into, okay, I know a couple of servers that I wanna go after, or here's the network range I'm interested in. Let me look for S3 buckets. Let me look at what TCP ports are open, UDP, SMB, file shares, all of that. And, and it's starting to see like, can I log into a file share anonymously? Did anybody store their credentials in that? Um, there's so many different pathways, but I think one of the, the easier ways, uh, of course, that a lot of people start with is like an in-map scan. Mm -hmm. And maybe I don't want to just in-map scan the whole network, the whole slash 24, every port. I want to be a little bit quieter. So I'm going to focus my scan down to just, let's go after port 80. What runs on port 80? Port 80 is mainly HTTP. 443 is HTTPS, I, I believe. So you can go after those if you're looking for like websites. So I'm going to do an MMAP scheme on that. I'm also going to just add MMAP, hey, give me a, a greppable output. Call it 80 host TXT. So there's a lot of different flags, a lot of different commands you can run. And then we can see that it's ran. And it looks like we have about uh, 13 or 14 hosts. You can see this one is up. 192, 168, 1318, uh, nine is closed. So I have some open, I got some closed. Mm -hmm. Not everything is open, there's 12 hosts. But what I did is I saved that file. If I cat 80 hosts TXT, we can see them. And then this kind of gets into a little more of those, uh, those hacker skills that you kind of have to learn getting comfortable with the command line uh, that I've been doing with, with OSCP. So let's see here. We have all the hosts. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cat this file. I'm going to pipe it. Let's grep for anything that's open. There's my three open hosts. Let's mm -hmm. go a little bit farther, though. Let's also do a little bit of cut. Uh, this is some bash scripting. Always fun to learn. Uh, and you can see I have the three IPs. Just cut it down. Give me the three IPs. And then let's actually save that. Open 80 ports TXT. Let's save it to a file. That way I can use this for my next piece. So I've ran one scan. I know that these three are available on port 80. Where am I gonna go with that now? What I think I'll do is I will say mmap, get me the service version, get me the service, I forget what SC stands for. Um, IL will throw it that list of our open ports and then give me an output as well, any info. Saving all my info as I go. That way I don't have to run these in-map scans over and over. I'm saving, I'm taking notes, I'm keeping all this information so I don't have to go get it again in the future. And once this kind of kicks off, we'll get a response back. It'll take a second, but we'll have way more detail on the target and where we can go from here as well. While we're waiting on that, um, Chris, anything you want to kind of add as far as like in-map and those things? 
Yeah, this you know this is one shovel deeper, right? You know, but none of this can really start, uh, or you can't get to where you are without um, without that kind of reconnaissance in the beginning. Um, but now, you know, we were at an organizational level, and then kind of an individual level, and then we were, you know, from kind of outside to inside. Um, you know, what do they look like? What are all the systems? What are some of the technologies that they have? Now we're interrogating particular hosts to see what services are on them, not just, you know, is a port open and closed, um, but what, uh, what is that service that's listening or is exposed that I can talk to? Um, you know, an SSH server, maybe, maybe you find an old version, older version of it, uh, an FTP server, maybe they, maybe they have, uh, it's for EDI transfer to company, maybe it's an older version of FileZilla um, that's exploitable, Maybe it's uh, anonymous access and they have some sensitive information in there. Um, you know, certainly 135, 139, 445, SIFs, um, and, and being able to uh, look at the file systems. Um, there's always uh, interesting data that you're going to, uh, to get here. And, and this is active. You are uh, interrogating hosts, services. Um, you are connecting with them. Um, you know, if they have logging on, if they have an intermediate firewall, those devices can see you connecting in from wherever you may be as well. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the biggest thing too, is when you run MMAP scans, that MMAP that I just kicked off for those three hosts, I probably sent, I would have to guess a few hundred packets to, to their network. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if this port's open. Let me try this port. We're trying maybe a hundred, 200 ports per host, we're trying to banner grab, grab all of this information that you see. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it can be a little too loud. You might have to go for a quieter approach, narrow your ports, um, narrowing the type of scan. Maybe don't do a, the three-handed uh, handshake with TCP. Maybe just do a SIN scan. Um, but I have this IP, you know, I can pick it up. I can start going and see if I can navigate to it. It looks like it's a, a login page. Maybe this becomes my next attack vector. Maybe mm -hmm. I try to log in with that T Riveris user. I try that password, doesn't work. Maybe I move on. I might not brute force it or I might. Um, it really just depends on what I'm finding out there, where I'm starting from the outside and how that helps me on the inside. So there's a lot of different ways that we can go. Um, I think the big thing though, again, is, is that mindset of what do you do when you're stuck probably have to go do some more recon. You probably need to go discover more. Um, if someone's not working, I, I don't know if you, Chris, have some some feedback on that. Yeah, you know, enumeration's an art, right? Um, uh, being able to, you know, make science out of it is important. Um, you know, what, what are the systems that I miss things along the way? You know, here, right, you, um, you know, if you, if you think of yourself standing in front of a locked door right now in front of that website, right, username, password, well, how many keys do you have on your key ring that you might be able to put in there to work, right? Um, you might be able to uh, um, uh, use a command line tool that um, you feed it all the usernames and passwords, right? There, there are plenty of, uh, plenty of tools that you can utilize to, uh, to do that um, uh, programmatically. Um, you know, so if, if you have gathered hundreds of uh, usernames, passwords, um, being able to efficiently test them all instead of putting them in one by one, um, you know, but th that's where you're at. And if you go through that ring of keys and guess what, those keys don't open that lock, you know, well, I'm going to have to go back and, and see, can I find some other keys? Can I find different doors? Um, you know, do, do I find some windows that potentially could be unlocked? Um, you know, a lot of this is just uh, continuing to try new things, look at things, um, but along the way, really building your own tool set, your own experience as well. Um, you, know, you know, being uh, um, kind of uh, young in this art, you know, you, you may not have uh, a very heavy toolbox with, uh, you know, hammers, mallets, uh, uh, plumbers, wrenches kind of hanging out of it. Maybe today it's you know, you've got 10 different things that you feel really comfortable with. But, um, you know, as you go through this process, you're, you're going to pick up a lot of things and have a better understanding of 
uh, what to use and when and how to use things and what things to look for, um, kind of becoming second nature a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with that, let's, that brings up a good point. I want to segue into kind of the OSCP and everything. But before I do that, um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them on chat. This is going to be the last call for questions. Um, and if there's anything that you're also interested in seeing us discuss, whether it's like password attacks, um, more live hacking, if there's a certain exploit or something that you're interested in, let us know. And we can always take that into consideration. But yeah, just to, to catch everybody up, I started going for the OSCP and, um, you know, don't have a lot of experience. It, it seems like a pretty lofty goal and um, it's very in-depth. There's a lot of material. I've been going through the book, the activities, and I know that you went through it, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your your tips, your, you know, what best practices would you recommend for anybody either wanting to get in security or going for some of these certifications? Well, um, offensive security has done a, a, a great job with it. Um, you know, it was probably one of the uh, more enjoyable uh, times that I'd re really spent uh, going through studying something. But I, I will also say this wasn't something that like I took a, a single class for 40 hours and then took a test the week after and passed. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm uh, a bit older. I've got uh, a lot, uh, not a lot of time on my hands. I've got two young kids. Um, but with that, you know, I wake up early every day. I would jump into the material. I would spend time in the lab over lunch. Um, you know, if I had time in between meetings, I might uh, try and squirrel away and uh, pop another box. Um, you know, after work, maybe uh, before dinner or after my kids went to bed, maybe I could squeeze in another couple hours. Um, it is a labor of love. Um, you really need to be uh, invested in it. And, um, you know, what, what I would suggest to you, try and find a study buddy. Um, I, uh, through the process and kind of through the, um, uh, uh, some of the forums, I'd met a couple of people who we kind of helped each other along the way when we were going through the lab. How does this work? I don't understand how this operates. Um, you know, instead of trying to be very prideful and do this yourself, find some folks that uh, can create some efficiencies for you and help you out along the way. You're still learning, um, but being able to take a page out of somebody else's book, um, you know, is, is helpful. Um, one thing that I, I really appreciate that they had done, um, Offensive Security had uh, put more focus around Active Directory. I, I think in their latest updates, like their, their test now includes a uh, domain controller. Um, and, and I think it's for all of their tests. When, when I had it, it was not, um, you know, I think the domain controller side of things is a little more real world. Every organization has some kind of centralized directory. Um, this is what attackers are targeting. I, th I think as uh, penetration testers, everyone should understand how to uh, attack uh, those types of systems. Um, you will get burned out. You will get tired. You will get frustrated. Um, just don't quit. You know, keep, keep grinding away on it. This was uh, seven months for me. You know, some people take this and in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, they kind of blow through it. Um, I, I unfortunately couldn't dedicate as much time, but I still got to the point where I was just tired of doing it. Um, when is this thing going to end? And um, their mantra of try harder um, is both uh, enlightening and incredibly frustrating. When you're going through it, banging your head in the same wall, why can't I get this? I've been working on the same service on the same host for three days and I can't get this thing to work right. And you go on to the forum and post a question and say, you know, I'm struggling, can anybody help? And somebody just says, try harder. You want to throw the whole thing out. Yeah. But at the end, you know, that try harder mentality of I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep talking to people. It, it gets you there. Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing I've learned too. And if you're not ready for the OSCP, I've, I would recommend as well, hack the box or try hack me. Those are also really great um, platforms that will hold your hand and, and teach you. Uh, the OSCP, it does require a little bit of money to, to get started, but 
the biggest thing in journal that I've also learned in the last six months is hacking is hard, mm -hmm. especially breaking so many different technologies. It's hard to, you know, know how to hack a Node.js app, hack a Java one, PHP, um, Active Directory. There's so much out there. Find what you're interested in, start trying it. It might not always work, find a walkthrough, but continue to persist and try harder as they say. And um, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I'm really loving it. And, um, you know, if anybody has any questions or feedback, you can always reach out to me. I'm sure Chris is open to it as well. And LinkedIn, we can always answer more questions for you. Um, with that being said, uh, Chris, do you have anything else you want to add? I know we're going to do the, the giveaway here in a second. Yeah, just that, uh, you know, and I think I said this to you last time. Um, you know, I, th I think all of us at times feel like imposters, right? This is a, a lifelong journey. I've been doing this for 25 years. I am still learning on a daily basis. Um, I, uh, uh, I have a membership to Cloud Guru. I'm trying to learn cloud things. Um, I uh, have a membership to try hack me because there, there are still things that I want to stay sharp on. Uh, I've got a book on my desk. I listen to podcasts. Um, you know, keep keep chasing, keep learning, um, but don't feel like you're you're either in this alone or that you're never going to learn everything because you can't. You you absolutely cannot. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't learn a particular subject, um, but you know, all, all of us are here trying to enjoy the journey, trying to uh, uh, learn, develop, grow, uh, and challenge ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Chris, I'll say just kind of to close and to wrap up, uh, it's been great to have you in the check in. Hopefully in the next six months or so, we'll be having uh, an OSCP or, or soon. I'm not sure when my time is going to have it fully done. But let me also announce who our winner is of the gift card. I think it's a $50 gift card, but we'll, we'll follow up with more detail. Ellie Ress, uh, you're the winner. So we'll be in contact with you. If you don't hear anything, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn and I'll make sure that we get you. But Chris, it's been great. I, I liked and enjoyed talking about active and passive, you know, information gathering. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. Awesome. Always, uh, always good talking to you and the team over there. We'll, uh, we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. See yep. you. See you guys. Take care, everybody. <laughs>